together. I keep on forgetting to bring Tito's vodka for that fridge. Oh, <laughs> 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 we're like next whatever, time, dude, whatever camera. you want to throw in there. Next time Ira plays, every time he does a kneeling overhead, <laughs> <laughs> pull from the stream, pull from the handle. <laughs> Welcome to episode number twenty-six of the Shankcast. Appreciate you joining us today. Hope you're doing well on and off the court. Really interesting topic today. <laughs> the, I'm just going to read right off the. There it is. Why most private lessons are a ripoff. Mark, you really, you really went for it here on this this title. Oh yeah, and I I, pr- I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I didn't hold anything back, and that's why we're here because we are able to talk about these things where most <laughs> tennis pros that work at traditional clubs, they can't. You can't talk about no. this, but we, I, I mean, and you might if if you're in full time like career club employee kind of coach, like you might completely disagree with us. Uh, in the first place, yeah. depending on, I, and I have no idea what Matt, Matt and Mark's you know, opinions are going to be on this. I think just based on the wording <laughs> that Mark <laughs> wrote up, maybe we can kind of infer a little bit of. I want to clarify though, there are coaches out there and there are classes out there where private lessons are totally, totally worth the dollar. But my argument is most of them are not. Interesting. Well, we've got uh, we've got some some beers here. This is a, oh uh, yeah, that was good. It's Friday, late afternoon, almost five o'clock. Yeah, yeah. Cheers, cheers. And this is a this is a serious topic, so we. Uh, get my hard drive. Oh yeah. Yeah. We need to Thanks. make sure we're prepared here. So, Mark, it, you're you're the one that wrote up the question. So, why don't you kind of lay the the groundwork here and maybe give us your thesis, <laughs> your your opening argument. Correct. And then we'll go around the table, and I guess from there, we, you know, we can bounce off. Matt can either agree or disagree. And then uh, I'll I'll do the same after Matt. Oh, and I can't wait to read the comments on this one because this is <laughs> this is gonna be good and uh-huh. that's perfectly okay. And so what I realized growing up is um, first of all tennis is super expensive. I grew up from an immigrant family, lower class, only child thankfully, so they could put me in a relatively well-to-do sport like tennis to keep me off the streets and to have some discipline and to be in good physical shape as you know as their only child, which is actually kind of scary if you think about it. But it's one of those things where When I was growing up in Illinois in the late 90s, early 2000s, a one-hour private lesson was $40. And now at some of these local clubs in the Milwaukee area, which I'm not going to name, it's like $80 to $100 Mm -hmm. for an hour lesson. Is it that high in Milwaukee? Yeah. I thought it was more like 60, 70 uh, range. But that's also on top of the membership fee you have to pay to be a part of that club. And that model is pretty apparent in almost all of the Midwest and possibly in other states like you know i think that's pretty standard yeah, yeah. It's, i would probably yeah the the price range is pretty accurate throughout mm-hmm. through across the board but the thing is i'm starting to realize that again most not all most of these lessons are not worth it because it's just a coach giving you maybe two to three drills for the 45 minutes you pick up balls for maybe seven minutes you take a break <laughs> to filler and then literally it's like a template the last 15 to 10 minutes just work on serves so it's that copy and paste and you're paying up to $100 an hour for that. And to be honest, most of these pros, I'm realizing, I said most, they really don't care. They're in it for the money. They just do it full time. I said most. Let me, let me, I'm going to come to the defense of the pros sure. a little bit uh, first, and then we'll kick it over to, to Matt. A, I don't disagree with anything you just said at all. Okay. <laughs> uh, completely on the same page. Uh, two things as far as like the coaches uh, not uh, sorry. Well, how did you phrase it? Not caring. Not not caring. They're again. Most of them are just in it for the money. They just stand beso- yeah, yeah. beside the cart and just feed balls <laughs> for forty five minutes. Yeah. So I think we'd we'd all like to believe that t- teaching or coaching kind of everybody views it through the lens of like oh there's such a uh, uh, kind soul to <laughs> to uh, dedicate their lives and careers to building up you know others and like helping them reach their goals and all that sort of thing but at the end of the day it's just like any other job (laughs) it's like certain people are going to find their way into those positions because they needed to pay the bills and they had some skills that were already tangential you know to whatever the position Mm -hmm. is right oh why don't i I, you know i could probably teach tennis you know i should get a summer job teaching tennis and they're like oh wow i made pretty good money like I don't really want to go back to school to get a boring like that. I'll just kind of keep teaching tennis. Yep. And a lot of teaching pros, I think, 
kind of back into the industry mm -hmm. uh, that way. And just like any other profession in, in life, whether you're an accountant or Good work at a ones. grocery store or, like, or you're a teacher, we all want to believe teachers are like saints. Mm -hmm. And many of them are. Like there's some incredible, you know, mentor, you know, teachers out there. But the majority, I think, are just trying to earn a check. Yeah. yeah. And so they are using the template. They 100%. It's like, oh, we'll work on your backhand for 10 minutes. Work on your, <laughs> your forehand for 10 minutes. Oh, hit a couple of volleys, and then you finish off with the, with the serves at the end. 100%. It's just like the rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. And if you teach next to those coaches for a day, day after day, week after week, month after month, you'll hear them give the same lesson to everybody who yeah. walks on the court over and over and over and over again. So if they're teaching that same lesson over and over again, it would make a lot more sense to just kind of post it on YouTube, right? <laughs> it's a little bit more scalable that way. <laughs> yeah, but you don't you don't keep making money off it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so I and there's I, some I want to kick it over to Matt, but there there's one other thing I want to say in defense of coaches, but uh, but I'll save that I'll save that. Uh, so I, I'm man, I, I'm in a I've. I feel I always feel awkward talking about this topic because on one hand I actually totally agree with your position mark but on the other I feel I feel a certain responsibility uh in my per, in my position to yep. not crap on the rest of the industry right. <laughs> <laughs> even though even though for the most part I totally agree with with yeah. everything you said Matt yeah so I'm going to take actually a different angle on this and and I agree with it too and and we've all taught next to bad coaches we and, and some like good ones too yeah a, a lot of good ones and more i think it's it's passion for what you're doing no mm -hmm. matter what you're doing and you can give an okay private lesson but if you're upbeat and happy and you, if you're observing it and not like completely like you know focused in but you're the court uh teaching next to it it yep. might be like hey that's uh, sounds like it's going well just because of the energy yep. and all that good stuff but to go back so i'm going to take a different angle I think the reason why most private lessons are a ripoff <laughs> is because the clients don't know what the hell they're doing. Oh. That's, so, that's connected to what I was going to come yeah, back to. So here's the thing. If you're taking currently private lessons and you go to your coach, I want to work on topspin, forehand, let's say. And the coach works it for 45 minutes and then does the standard 10 minutes of service because, like, what the hell <laughs> else? got to get, water, get yeah. water, pick up the balls. Do you need water? That's, so, like, the best <laughs> question for a coach. So my 100%. question to the, to the students, Jeez. to the clients that are taking these lessons, from the next time you're taking your lessons, have you done anything mm. to improve your topspin forehand? Have you acted on anything yeah, the coach told you? Anything he yeah. told you. The next time you go for your lesson, are you working yeah. on that same shot? Or are you like, now, now I want a one-handed backhand? And it's like, But does Whoa. the coach have responsibility in providing uh, homework and following up with the students to make sure think, that they put in the work? Yeah, I mean, I think a like a good coach will see where the track is. And, and I'm assuming we're talking about repeat lesson takers because we all have the Band-Aid lesson takers, right? They take one and they're done. Yeah. Um, but let's say this is a repeat. Yes, I think they a good coach should definitely provide some sort of action plan for that. But I think on the student side, realistic expectations also are my shot is going to be fixed quickly. Mm -hmm. And they don't actually want to put in the time. So my yeah, analogy yeah. to it is my wife's uh, sister. So my uh, sister-in-law, she's been in the fitness industry basically her whole career. Mm -hmm. So. To me, it's like going on a personal training session, doing it once, and you're coming back next week, and you're going to eat pizza and Chinese food, and, and it's just like, and, and the trainer's like, did you, did you eat clean this week? Well, no, I, you know, I had a couple beers, and it, it, to me, it's the same thing. So I think personally, it starts with the student, um, and I would say, in, again, this is just my professional uh, years. A, I don't know, 60% of the people I actually taught, I don't know how much better they actually wanted to get. Wow, good for you for making the for making that statement. Yeah, I I mean I think they. But you're blaming them. You're just well, of course. <laughs> I mean I, I'm an amazing coach. I mean it is never me. So, um, <laughs> but but I think I think it's but then it, it it does go to the coach too because you do have people that will. You know, they'll text and say, hey, I had a tournament this week or I had a, a league match and I got my second serves in. Mm -hmm. And they're like, OK, 
you know, sure. And I, but I, I'm going to put a little more of this actually on the client versus the coach. And that's a good point. That's actually an angle, and you're right. That's an angle I didn't think about when you know writing this somewhat negatively, you know, phrase question. But yeah, I mean, as a client, you want to get your money's worth, so you need to have some sort of homework, like in personal training. You know, stop eating pizza every night. Right. Stop eating, doing all these bad habits. But yes, there is a responsibility for the consumer to be able to say, hey, what can I work on? between now Mm -hmm. and our lesson next week for you know the next hour i will say though i will turn this back i'm gonna piggyback off of that by the way correct so save that in your hard drive yeah yeah yeah. or flash drive real quick but what i'm seeing on the what i'm seeing on the court sometime most of the time in these um private lessons for its indoor outdoor you know that type of private lesson is during that hour or so that coach is actually not hitting with the student they're just feeding yeah they say hey good job good job kind of that um skit that you and ira did at yeah, essential that tennis was, that was so good well i mean it's ever. so good there's i mean there's it's funny because there's a lot of truth behind it if yeah. you think about oh, it. oh we yeah we specifically when we when we planned out that video uh that was our goal was to to find the most cliche yeah actions phrases drills like things that we all actually have seen again and again yeah. and again and which is why the video like did so well is because every, if you read the comments everybody's basically like oh shoot that's my coach yeah. <laughs> like, well, and, and what was it you showed me uh when i first joined it was was it trevor noah the brush uh, yeah what that was yeah, yeah, yeah. so good getting ready for his uh uh uh, his match with Federer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just brush the ball. Brush, just brush. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever seen that? No, Tre- I, Trevor oh, Noah. It's, it's un- so It's incredible. Awesome. It's exactly what you're uh, talking about, Mark. Yeah. So, I'm assuming it was a charity event that he was. Preparing yeah, he was for. playing okay. with yes. Yes. Uh, Federer, or he's playing with Nadal against, or the other way around against Bill Gates and ah. and Federer. Yeah. Okay. And they basically hooked him up with some some coaching some ahead coach, of time, so yeah. he, so he could get the ball back over the net. Yeah, well, as soon as we're done recording this, we're gonna yeah, we're gonna play it. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah. Okay. Tyler, could could we drop in some audio to the recording? Okay. Okay. We're gonna play it for for those of you watching right now. It's <laughs> 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 good stand up bit. <laughs> oh, it's so good. So how how good of an illustration is that? that? That's basically a very e- slight exaggeration from what we see on a day to day basis for most of these private lessons. We were mm-hmm. talking about the carbon copy like yep, nature yep. of like how coaches just get into their rut, and it's the only way they know how to like see the tennis Correct. world is whatever their cliche like phrase or word is. Yeah. that's like all they have. And I'm guilty of it too. Like one thing I start to see myself or to hear myself talk is <laughs> the, not brush, but like <laughs> bend your knees. Bend your knees. Bend your knees. <laughs> Bend your knees. Yep. And that's when I was like, oh, you know, I got to take a hold of myself and I'm sounding like a broken record. This student of mine has heard it 10 times in a matter of 10 minutes and not receptive. Okay, I got to change some yep. things. But unfortunately, from what we've seen, that happens to almost a lifetime for some of these coaches. But that's the crazy thing is that is that coach that he took and, and it, maybe it was, it was just a bad match. Like I'm, I'm, tr- I'm always going to try to give the benefit of the doubt yeah. to to coaches because I'm, I'm just a nice guy, I guess. <laughs> but um, that's the thing. He's probably making six figures a year mm-hmm. just repeating the yeah. same stuff to lesson after lesson after lesson, day after day, week after week, year after year. Uh, and so th- to me, that kind of exemplifies like your, you know, title of yeah. this. It's like... Uh, at what point does a coach need to actually go outside of his own box and come up with a unique solution to fit a unique student? Because every student's going to need a little yeah. bit different way of understanding how to overcome the problem. Yep. And if they don't have 50 different ways of explaining the same thing, then you're only useful to one out of 50 students. Right. Well, is that, do you think that's um, like an identifying the problem slash intelligence thing or is that a passion thing i think it's a passion I, thing. passion okay. yeah definitely yeah. i mean I, I think for for it do you want to learn how to do it 50 ways yeah mm-hmm. in in, in that of the way that works for you right and <laughs> and if you think about and go back kind of the carbon copy lesson right if you bring somebody on the court and they hit a couple good forehands which let's say you're working on yep and they got a great sweat they typically come off that court and say that was a great lesson Okay, it's the nature of tennis. We have a very 
tough thing of like what we're working on versus what is actual success. Now, if you took a student and you changed their grip slightly and you did shadow swings, drop hits, and feeds to work on that mechanic, especially on the adult side. The kids side are more like sponges and they'll, they don't know what's a good lesson or not. Yep. That adult would probably nine times out of 10 come out and say, that wasn't worth my time. But it got and the that, job done. It, it, I don't disagree, but it's it's the optics of kind of changing what. This is what I wanted to piggyback. Yeah, on. what yeah. what what is really success and what you're spending your money on, and I think that's the other thing too is, if if the student has a clear grasp of why they're spending their discretionary income, mm-hmm. that's step one. Yeah. Are are you doing it for exercise? Are you doing it to really get better? And you can do that in so many different ways. But are you are you going to take on the also the responsibility and, and on the coach's side too of like, okay, Ian wants to learn a new backhand. I can't do 20 minutes per private lesson once work, a week, once a week <laughs> on his backhand. Like if this is what you really want and, and you do have to, as a coach, you do have to push back on the student. Yep. Like, no, no, no. If this is what you want, this is how we're going to have to get there. It's going to be a lot of time and mm-hmm. effort and things like that. Yeah, Mark, you said, but it gets the job done. I think the question that needs to be asked is, what job does the student want to get done? Well, yeah, and if there's a student that just wants a workout and a glorified ball machine at right. $100 an hour on a court on an indoor you know, t- tennis facility, okay, go ahead. But here's the problem. Most students want that, but they aren't honest enough with themselves or with the coach to actually realize that it's actually what they want. Yeah. Because when it push comes to sh- when push comes to shove, if you ask them if they want to change their grip and get worse for a month before they get better, the vast majority of tennis students no. do not want that. They they don't want that path. So is it the idea of instant gratification? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, and this comes back to uh, Matt earlier was talking about the fitness example. At the end of the day, most humans don't want to change their habits, and so going to the gym and taking that personal training session it's like almost almost yeah, I'm about to sound really cynical it's almost kind of like a virtue signal like move like see like i'm i'm going yeah. to like do my part like i'm i'm trying like i'm working my favorite is they're posting on instagram <laughs> social media 100% yeah. like 100% it's, it's like a plague at that point yeah. 100% they're just doing it for the show and then they leave and they they go about their daily life the way they they you know normally do it yeah. and they they don't actually make any sacrifices to reach the goals that they would really truly like to achieve because they just don't want to be that uncomfortable and it's the same thing in tennis people will tell you when they sign up for a private lesson well that's why i'm signing up for a lesson i want to get better at tennis Mm -hmm. but when they hit their serve and you're like like we like (laughs) we we have some work to do here and they're like uh can't you just give me like a little like like a little tip or like a tweak because you know i don't really want to make it that hard i don't want to change that much so just give me a little something that'll make it like five percent better and i can do that but it's not going to actually move the needle in a meaningful way for the for the student correct so i think there's a disconnect for students they think they want to get better but what they really want is activity and exercise and almost the illusion of like improvement and so career tennis coaches get in a rut of providing that service for most of their clients. So your solution is assuming each party, both the client and the coach knows what they want. It's actually the coach's job to say no. Yeah. This is not, I'm actively in that. (laughs) Yeah. In that. Yeah. Yeah. Where like I live in Wisconsin and charge a lot for my time and those gateways Mm -hmm. automatically filter out. There's nobody in the whole city of Milwaukee that wants to take lessons from me uh, <laughs> because I do. <laughs> nobody, nobody here takes it seriously enough that it's actually worth it for them yeah. to come here and spend time with yeah. me. Um, and so I've kind of filtered out all of the, the tire kicker, like uh, activity seeking, you know, students because I don't want to provide that service. Yeah. Um, and that's what most students want is that kind of service. Mm-hmm. But my argument against from a consumer perspective, right, is there's nothing wrong with activity. There's nothing wrong with having a good sweat. Oh, absolutely. Sweat. Right. They just need to be honest about why yes. they're showing up. But they could do that with a friend. They could do that with a hitting partner that they could do yeah. trade-off let lessons me, with. Yeah, let me be really – I'm not, ju- I'm not yeah. casting shade or, like, yeah. judgment on – like, if you just want that, ac- that activity, if you want that exercise, then 
awesome. Like God, God bless you. That, that's fantastic. Just don't come to me and tell me you want to get better and then push back against everything I ask you to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and I think to highlight that though, too, is again, kind of going back to my earlier point, when you're trying to make big changes of muscle memory, it has to be broken down from the core, you yep. know, stripped down. And then you build upon that where if you look at kind of what you said, it's a project. Yeah. Even if I started on a progression of like a, a stereotypical lesson, right? You yeah. start off a little, assuming this person can hit the ball back and forth, like a three, five lesson. You start a little mini tennis, yep. maybe you both go back to the baseline, you hit some ground stroke, one comes up to the net, all that, you know, stereo. But if you, Again, I kind of go back on the other side is if I said, all right, I'm going to spend this whole lesson with me on the same side of the net as you. I bet you if I got 10 lessons, 10 new clients, I bet you eight of them would not come back. Mm -hmm. And and I would get two that like, hey, I love that. I actually I'm starting to figure out X, Y and Z. But I bet you that, you know, and as a as a tennis coach, if that's your percentages of retain retention, you're going to be not trouble. Food on the table. Yeah, that's going to be a lot of trouble right that's there. That's where I'm starting to notice. I'm not saying this because I fall into this category, but something I'm starting to notice is the best private lesson type of coaches are actually people that are part-time hmm. because they have passion, they have they energy. They don't have to maintain yeah. a full clientele. Yeah. I don't stuff. have to keep you, but if you do come, I will give you passion. I will give you good advice. I will tell you things you don't want to hear to make you a better tennis player. Well, and, and, and you think, you know, being in the industry full time, I mean, you've been, you know, doing essential tennis for a long time now. But before that, you know, even our internships, I mean, the reality is simple. It, it's hard to be on 45, 50 hours yep. to, to have, even if you're the most passionate person, to have that energy to be in a mental and physical job to exert that day in, day out. And, and I mean, it's, it's really challenging. Mm -hmm. And then it's like everything else. Like we joked about. Uh, when you coach with somebody else is, you know, I could go to Ian and say, hey, I'm I'm just I don't have it today. Like, I need you to have a little <laughs> more energy for me to, like, piggyback off you. Yeah. But if Ian comes in and he's not feeling it and I'm not feeling it, it's like nobody's feeling it. And that's the same as the student. Right. If the student's kind of more down to and, and I, I personally think it's a coach's first job to kind of yep. lift their spirits up, you know, to provide that passion. But I, I just think, like you said, I, I just think that the. the the whole model, in my personal opinion, of tennis is super antiquated to start, right? We don't use as much technology. I mean, essential tennis does. But overall, yeah. like, clubs don't. Clubs don't put in the money for that. I mean, you look at every golf, private golf thing. They have cameras everywhere. It's embarrassing for tennis. It is. In, in, you go to a country club, and you look at what's being provided yeah. in a private golf oh, lesson and a nuts. private tennis lesson. And, and, and it's not to say the, the pros – couldn't go that way but when you're the tools they get versus other industries but the clientele been, doesn't necessarily want it either. i don't disagree with congressional that. uh i offered video analysis and nobody wa no. nobody wanted it no. i offered this is in 2000 and like seven so before okay. this essential tennis thing yeah became a thing i offered uh uh, a login portal for members to be able to uh, go in and see the stroke analysis from their last like lesson. Yeah. Nobody and nobody <laughs> wanted it. So <laughs> why why the hell are you taking lessons then if you want to improve if you don't want to break down a stroke from a third party perspective? Exercise. Yeah. You, you answered your own social thing. socialization. Social, yeah. Um, it's insane because it's a. I mean, and Matt and I, I think, spend most of our time yeah. in private like club environment yeah. where where people are paying that money for the community kind of aspect. Yeah. So it's a status. Well, thing. I don't even know. Not necessarily it's, status, but yeah. it's, it's more relational, um, uh, building relationships yeah. and having an outlet for your social kind of engagement type stuff. But but I think of this too is... And right? that's not every tennis player, by yeah. the way. No, no, definitely not. And, but I, I think about it as, you know, I've gotten older too, is... So a couple of years ago, me and a bunch of buddies, we, we went from a softball league to a bowling league. Like, it's just yeah. guys drinking, having fun, right? If they said, hey, we're going to do a weekly bowling lesson to try to get better, I would take it. I would spend the money. Yeah. But I would not put any more time into that because I just don't have the passion. That's not why you're showing up. <laughs> showing up to have a beer with the guys. It, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that's okay. And I think, it, it, like, kind of going back, what Ian said, it's, it's really just looking in the mirror, 
mm-hmm. of why you're actually here. And then, so I actually got an email um, in the Essential Tennis uh, box. It was probably like a week ago, and they were asking advice like how to approach a coach about their coaching style. And it was a group lesson. And I said, first thing I said to her, I'm like, okay, tell me a little more what's going on. And and she was saying they're doing different drills on different courts. Okay. And, you know, it's only an hour and a half drill, a lot going on. So they're not getting so many little tidbits, a lot to take in. And I said, okay, well, first thing is, do they have a theme? And they said, she said, yes. I'm like, okay, well, whatever that theme is, focus on one thing you want to try to accomplish in that theme. So if you're, you're going to the net, like – um, trying to hit a first volley, what, whatever that is. I don't know what particular to work on. And, and then she's like, oh, that's great advice. And I said, well, the other question I have is, have you ever, like, in a, a very calming, positive way, ever talked to the coach about what you might want to work on? Mm-hmm. And she's like, well, absolutely not. I was like, well, there's your problem right there. I said, if you want something in particular, and again, how your tone comes off mm-hmm. really st- sets it but i said if if you would like to work on something or say hey you know if we're working on x y and z i would like a little more technical instruction and if they're not going to give it to the rest of the class that's fine but yeah no coach is going to be like okay i'm, I'm just going to blow you off they'll, they'll be like hey you need to change your grip you need yeah. to do it so i think that as well is it's it's not an easy conversation because but there's responsibility on both sides 100 percent yeah. 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 The student has to take ownership. But like if they're not getting what they right. need, then they, they have to, you have to take ownership as the player to communicate to the coach and be like, can you give me what I need? Like it's a give and take really like, yeah, you're paying them for their time. Yes, they're the expert, mm-hmm. but you are paying their mortgage and paying <laughs> yes. their, you know, utilities and their, their food and everything else. So, so I think I know what Ian's answer would be. So let me ask you this, Mark. Okay. Okay. So you have these coaches, right? That are given the carbon copy template lesson. Okay. Why, in your opinion, are students coming back? Because the students, part of it you guys already touched on, they don't know what they want. Second of all, they're afraid, again, vast overgeneralization, they're afraid to kind of explore what is out there, what else is different. So, you know, obviously if you're in high school and you're a mid-level varsity player around the area, you know, you're going to go to a few clubs around this area, which I won't name. And that's what you're going to stick with. You're not going to branch out to your local park. And, you know, when you're hitting with your friends, oh, there's this guy that's, you know, 30, 31 giving a good private lesson. I think it's hard for people, like whether you're adults or your kids, to approach that type of person in kind of in a a public setting. And, you know, the worst thing I could say is no. (laughs) Yeah. And um, it's just the idea of, you know, not having as much information like, oh, I could do that to have like a good quality lesson at literally a quarter of the price. Right. So, yeah, part of it is the responsibility of not only the coach. I know I've been bashing on the coaches all day for this this podcast, but also the responsibility of the client to identify the issue and see what else they could do better to ask around and have a better quality service at a better price. Definitely. Yeah, I think it's just to boil I think that's a good answer. Boil it down. I think people are afraid of change. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't want to leave the status quo. Uh, wherever all the good players take lessons, yeah. it's like, oh, well, obviously, like yep. that's that's where I need to be going. And whatever style those lessons are, like nobody really argue. And, and how how could you? Like if you're a a parent, like trying to help your high performance or whatever a high school level, you know, junior player try to develop. Like who are you to be like this? is wrong when everybody else is doing it. Yeah. And so I feel for the, you know, on the student side of things, um, you know, you're kind of put in a, in a difficult position and that's, yeah, there's responsibility on both ends, but, um, but, hmm. but I think the other thing too, that's really difficult for the, the consumer side of things too, is if you think about it, right. Tennis coaches are based on their playing merits to start. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Uh, it is. But, I mean, yeah. if you look at a bio of every – and, again, it's really hard to say, like, unless you've taught at – you know, you do see some, hey, uh, coached, um, you know, kid to sectionals yeah. or states. Yeah, and all, all, of yeah. But, again, that was or... that was never my specialty. Like, yep. I, I, I didn't have a passion to teach that level, like, of kids. I didn't want to deal with the parents and all that good <laughs> stuff. Um, but it, it's pretty funny because, you like, Ian Westerman – 
played at Ferris State University. It just goes through this long list of you, your playing career. It has nothing to. And it's hard to put like coaching, like how good of a coach you are on on paper. Yep. Um, but I would just say too on, on, you know, on the consumer side of things, you're gonna have to unfortunately probably test the waters a little yep. bit, right? Go to that coach if you have a connection for whatever you're looking to work on. Great. If you don't feel like you're getting your money's worth for whatever reason, no. if you if you think it's a lost cause, <clears throat> that's one thing. If not, approach the coach, but then move on. You yeah. know, do do something else. I think a lot of consumers feel very stuck. Like yes, they they feel froze. They're like fearful of uh, of pulling the ripcord yeah. and being like, I'm going some like they feel like it's a the coach is going to be offended or it's like a judgment on the club or the coach or whatever. And, and, and this is kind of going back on the coach is like, you have to have, well, I think most people in the tennis industry have some pretty thick skin. Well, not everyone. Not every, yeah. <laughs> pretty sensitive. <laughs> some are too, but I'll never forget. I was uh, one of my first clubs. Like I took a kid basically from scratch up almost to like 10 and they were starting to play tournaments. They're getting good. good. And I approached the parents and I said, I have to pass off this student to this coach at There's the same time. not a lot of coaches that'll do that. And I'm that. like, I just, I'm not, th- this is beyond my like wheelhouse. Was it a timing issue or like? No, no, no. I just didn't think I could get that kid okay. where yeah. th- th- there was like some serious potential. That's with a lot kid. of guts And I was just like, that. he needs to rare, go yeah, rare, to yeah. this coach. But like, I wasn't hurt about it because, you know, pat myself on the own back. I had a pretty good personality. I was probably going to fill that billable hour with somebody else yep. so i wasn't i was never intimidated like i'm going to start losing clients now um i was like this is the best thing for the kid yeah um but on the adult recreation side i don't think you get a ton Correct. of that where you have to do that but but again i think that's tough too because i always like hey we're the coaches are a team here like mm-hmm. that we're in the best students uh, or best interest of the students but it's it's a lot more of unfortunately um they're all kind of we're all in it for ourselves and it shouldn't be that mentality yeah. but it, it gets that way well i mean like if your mortgage if your college fund for your kids you know bottom line money is dependent on it you're gonna try to get your clients to come back whether yep. or not you say things to improve yep. them in the future there you go months. there you go yep and that's it that's shouldn't have taken tough. us this long to, to get to that but yeah. i think you just hit the nail on the but head that's yeah. that's freaking tough the cookie cutter lesson, in my opinion, is direct response to providing the consumer yeah. yep. what they come back for. Yeah. Yep. But the thing is, the consumer doesn't know what they want, as we yeah. have touched on. Yeah. So it's 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 like almost like a plague of I wouldn't say just American tennis, but you're seeing this in several different industries as well. Yeah. Where if you see a physician and say, "Hey, you got to cut this out, otherwise you're going to be very sick." Well, I don't want to hear that. I'll go see another physician. Right. And it's gonna. Thanks. It's gonna kick your butt ten years down the road when, you know, you're you have very unhealthy symptoms because of your lifestyle because you didn't listen to that doctor that actually was very very good. Do you have a five o'clock group? Yep. Okay, so they're here. So we need to wrap up. So so bottom line here. Private lessons are a ripoff if it's a cookie cutter coach providing cookie cutter f- feedback. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. It's Agreed. like same, cl- same yep. phrases, same words. Like every single student, every single day. It's probably not worth your money. Yeah. Um, what are other kind of conclusions that we came? Like, it's a ripoff. If like kind of finish the sentence. Yeah, I would just say it's it it's a ripoff if you don't. So I'm gonna go a little more general. If it's a ripoff if you don't feel like you got your money's worth. And, and at the end of the day, if you feel like I said, if that seventy dollars was worth that one hour kick-ass workout it's not a ripoff totally agree. It, it, it's totally whatever agree. you deem the value of your time and your money that's it and yeah. and ev- and i think that's the other thing everybody has this different what they what they're trying to get out of it and that's the same thing like the students are are all different too and that's yeah. a, gr- a great coach has to be in in a club setting has to be a chameleon some yeah. want very technical some yeah. want relationship based so some want therapy sessions. Yeah. Therapy sessions. Others want steps on their Fitbit. Right, exactly. <laughs> and my opinion, Mark? um, if it's a ripoff if you just feel like you're hearing the same thing over and over and over again and you've kind of hit a brick wall. Mm. And again, this is coming back to what Ian and Matt said, where at that point it's up to the consumer to really reach out with different avenues or different options. That could be a different coach, a different club, or approaching, you know, this person that you see teaching at a public court. Just try it. Right. It's the worst that could happen. 
All right. Well, we're out of time. It was a great time. That was a good uh, one. We could yeah. probably, with enough beers, we could probably <laughs> we could solve. The <laughs> yeah, we could solve that problem. Right there. Yeah, we, we could definitely <laughs> talk about that for hours and hours. Uh, thank you so much for listening today. Hope you enjoyed it, and make sure to tune in next time. Matt and Mark, thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk to you guys next time. See ya.